Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Danielle Brown, and uh, I work for ServiceNow, and I'm a senior talent acquisition partner, um, so I specialize in recruitment. Um, so we are a global software company, um, so we specialize in automation and digital workflows. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, overcoming imposter syndrome, but before we start, I'm just going to allow everyone to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Joseph Marino. I'm an enterprise sales executive. I've been in sales for over 15 years. I manage uh, strategic accounts and commercial accounts in ServiceNow. Good afternoon. I am Abby Onifade, and I'm an advisory solutions consultant. Been in the industry for over 20 years, and I look after one of ServiceNow's marquee accounts. H Hello, my name is Alanzo Blackstock. So I've been in the IT industry for around about 35 years. I know I don't look that old. Um, and uh, I've been in service now for the last three years. I run our channel sales business. We sell a lot of our technology through partners, about 200 partners in the UK, and I run that organization. Excellent. So let's get started. So can you all give me one word um, that describes imposter syndrome? Self-doubt. Anxiety. Stress. <laughs> Stress. And mine is perfection. And I, um, that's something I still live with today, um, where I'm always trying to be perfect and always trying to get to the next level um, and thinking I'm superhuman. My husband calls me Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, all right, so my first question to you, Joseph. So how do you arm yourself going into the workplace? I think the first thing is to understand that you're unique as a person and be comfortable with who you are. Um, secondly, you have to have a zeal to learn because in every, most of your, you know, going into the workplace for the first time, you will be an imposter because you'll be new in the workplace. So you need to own that and be comfortable in your lack of knowledge and be comfortable that people who are more competent within the business are going to support you as long as you ask questions and you show that keenness to learn. And the thing about competent people is once they see that, because a competent person understands that they don't know everything. So if they see in you that you don't know everything and you're willing to learn, they're willing to help. And this is how you find mentors and people that you're aligned with. The second thing is planning. So as you learn, you need to start putting plans in place in terms of your career or in terms of a project or in terms of what you're trying to achieve within your role. Because your learning starts to map into your plans and that starts to drive confidence. So as you learn and you plan, you achieve each milestone and every time you achieve a milestone, don't forget to celebrate. Buy yourself a coffee. Do something small because it is your plan that you've delivered against. And that starts to drive away the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'd say, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with work, but it helps. Do something you love. I love to play football. I'm not great. Mm -hmm. But every time I score a goal, I'm like, I'm good enough. And that helps reinforce the self-doubt and pushes it away. Have people you love around you. My wife is over there number one cheerleader, and also create a comfortable environment within your workspace. If you're unique and authentic, you'll attract unique and authentic people, and they will, you will coalesce with them, and you'll build that sort of support system that you need to achieve the first two things. So three things. You're unique, learn, plan, do something you love. Well, that's four. That's four. <laughs> Thank you for the extra bonus, <laughs> the bonus one. Okay, lovely. So, Alanzo, question for you. Um, what would you tell your younger self? Um, what would I tell my younger self? In the context of imposter syndrome. Yeah. Because I think I tell him a lot of things. Um, I, I think I would, I would say um, don't, don't take it seriously. Don't take things as seriously as I did. I think um, when I was growing up, so um, my family is um, Jamaican. Shout out for the Jamaicans out there. 
Um, and so grew up in a traditional Jamaican household um, back in the 1980s, 70s and 80s. And the thing about um, the, the household was it was about working as hard as you can to, because you knew things were against you, you knew things were going to be not on your side, so you had to work harder than the next guy in order to get where you want. And so I feel like I put too much pressure on myself to be the best I could be. And as a result of that, I think over the years, you know, 30 years into my career, 35 years into my career, I'm still suffering from that work as hard as I can in order to get the right thing. So I think I would say to myself, just kind of like do the best you can and be confident in your own self and, and don't necessarily seek external validation and because sometimes that validation doesn't come or doesn't come from where you'd expect it to come. So that's what I think I would say to myself. And clean up your room, don't be so facey to your parents and all those sorts of other things. <laughs> Amazing. I always got told when I was growing up, um, I know I look 18, by the way, I keep getting told that. So <laughs> um, I was always told that we have to work as a black person, we always have to work 10 times harder. So going into the workplace, I was always trying to be the top achiever. Well, I was, I don't know about right now, but <laughs> I always was, um, over the last eight, nine years of my career, was um, the, top, the top performer in the team. And if I wasn't, if I was, come, you know, if I was second in line, um, then that was a problem for me. And uh, a manager always said, Danielle, why do you always feel like you have to do more and achieve more? And when I get there, it's like I don't, I don't accept the compliments. I get a lot of compliments to say, oh, you're amazing, you're inspirational. But I still don't, inside, I still don't accept it. Um, and I'm always looking for the next thing to, to try and conquer and achieve. I mean, I, but I think to that point, that, that's partly because of one is that you're, you're trying to um, deliver on excellence that isn't defined. It's just harder, harder, more, more, more. That's one thing. And then the other thing is, is that you're in a workplace that is kind of like, not like you all the time so you're judging yourself with other people that may you don't may not feel have had to work as hard as you you may not see people like you above so you think how do i get there so there's all this pressure on you this is why i think a lot of people in the black community have imposter syndrome because there's there's this work hard ethic but you never feel that you get that to that stage or to that state and you always think that there's something more or there's something more that people expect of you. And I think that's why it was, uh, it was really true in terms of when you were talking about actually just be grateful of the things that you've done. Yeah. Just kind of like remember the things that you've done that grounds you back to actually I am good enough. I am fine. I've done well. And I think all of us have really done well in our careers, right? We've really kind of like excelled in terms of where we were. And we should be, just be happy with that. But yet we still have that imposter syndrome in the back of our minds thinking, have we done enough? Does this guy recognize this? Can I do better? Should I do more? That hard work ethic, I think sometimes works against us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I definitely think it's a gift and a curse because the imposter syndrome to drive perfectionism allows you to achieve success, but then you never get to celebrate the success. Yeah, exactly. Because you think it's never enough and you keep going and that's, that drives the sort of wrong outcomes in terms of stress, like you said. So we should be comfortable with wanting to achieve, mm -hmm. but we should also be comfortable to celebrate our achievement as we achieve. Yeah. And I think it's that balance that allows you to sort of ride the wave of imposter syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so question for you, Abby. Can you give us an example of when you've actually experienced imposter syndrome and how you overcame it? I recall at the very beginning of my career, feeling the imposter syndrome, typically during the promotion cycles, the successful promotion cycles. So I'd go from being a senior consultant to a principal, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, that was a stroke of luck. I'd go from principal to manager, still grateful for that stroke of luck, manager to director, I'm now grateful for the luck and planets aligning together, right? These are all feelings that I had and never really feeling worthy of being that guy, you know, at that moment. 
And on reflection, I used to look at this situation and tell myself that somebody has already vetted me. Somebody knew, well, presumably knew what they were doing when they were in the process of promoting me. And I should put much more trust on those individuals that I'm actually there and I'm worthy for that particular role. And I shouldn't have to posture. I shouldn't have to go through a feeling of self-doubt to be in that role, but rather that I have something of value that I can share with my clients and my colleagues. So in summary, it's that feeling of luck is what shrouded my mindset and certainly helped me to recognize that imposter syndrome was impacting me during these promotion cycles. Yeah. And I often find that um, when I'm hiring someone, uh, some, a, a lot of the time it's women, unfortunately, um, they don't necessarily see their self-worth. So when I ask the question, um, so what would you be looking for in terms of salary? Give me an indication. And a lot of the times they undersell themselves or they don't negotiate with me. Um, I know I, we always have a set budget, so sometimes we can't go over that, but there usually is a little bit of wriggle room to ask for more. Men, on the other hand, they'll say exactly what they want. They will oversell themselves um, a lot <laughs> and have to bring them back down to reality oft, um, quite often. Um, but women, yeah, we really do under, undersell ourselves a lot of the times. Um, so my next question to Joseph. So tell me about a time when you experienced um, imposter syndrome. Um. I think moving to the UK from Nigeria in 2008 was a bit of a sh culture shock. Um, you know, to your point around parents pushing, when my, when my dad said, this is the last thing I'm going to pay for. So if there are any Nigerians out there, you'd have heard this before. All your friends that have come first, they don't have two heads. So, <laughs> so he said, you must finish with a distinction or I like rights. So you come in with that sort of pressure into a new learning environment, new people. And I had to learn, I, I knew my master's was in Scotland. So I had to tune my ears into understanding Scottish <laughs> dialect. Um, all of my sort of university experience within in Nigeria is very, very different to learning in the UK, just from a curriculum perspective. And also, you know, engaging with new people. So the very first, sort of semester was not great. It was a learning experience. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be there. There was this pressure in my mind from my father saying, you have to be first. And it was a huge le learning curve for me. Now, by the time I got into my second semester, I was on the distinction trail. But there was that period of, I am not worthy to be here. These people are much better than me. They've schooled here. It's just been, it was, it was very difficult. And that sort of came into the workplace as well. Um, working, because I worked in Nigeria before I moved to the UK. Obviously, all black people, you know, there's the, the imposter syndrome from that perspective is more mental. These people are smarter than me, right? But in the UK, it's these people are smarter than me and they probably have home advantage as well. Even though it might not exist, right? But you create that in your mind and that creates self-doubt. And sometimes you're in a meeting room with a bunch of, you know, tenured people and you're like, too young to be here, right? I'm, I'm not worthy of being here. But again, to my earlier point around arming yourself, if you're unique, you learn, you will earn your rights at the table or earn your seats at the table. Absolutely. And, and another, I'll share one of my experiences. Um, I was about to say what year it was, but you'll be able to guess the company. Um, so many years ago, um, in my earlier career, I represented a really large business unit. Um, I was really young. And um, I remember having to go into kind of like a boardroom and I was already feeling nervous because um, I knew I was going to be the youngest one in there. And when I opened the door, it was a mass, there was a, it was a massive room of a huge table full of white men, white, white older men. And they all looked at me and as if to say, what are you, are you in the right room? Are you the 
the cleaner maybe. And I felt that instant feeling of, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be here. But it was just a split second. And then I I had to talk to myself and say, I'm going to own this space and I'm going to own this room. And I walked in there with my head high and I said, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danielle. I'm representing this particular business unit. And, and, you know, after uh, being in that room for an hour, Every, and when you get to know me, yeah, everybody was, you know, uh, we built a lot of friendships and uh, it, was a gr- it was a great success, uh, a great successful time. But that initial reaction um, from, from, from the people in the room, yeah, was quite intimidating. But I always tell myself, I'm worthy to be here. I'm going to own this space that I'm in. And I'll probably crumble when I get out of this meeting. But right now I've got this space. Yeah. <laughs> Same question for me, right? I think um, in terms of uh, in a, a time when I had imposter syndrome, and I, and, I, and I say to that, actually, I don't think I've never not had imposter syndrome. I think I actually live with it throughout my career. It's, 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 a, it's a question of how I cope. So I can think of like any period of my career where there's things that have happened where I've questioned myself, where I've questioned whether I feel like I'm good enough in the role that I was doing. I remember particularly when I was a salesman, I got um, promoted to be the manager for the, the same sales department I was working from. And I ended up having to be the manager for these five or six white men that were my peers like two seconds ago. That really put me into a position of, am I, am I worthy? Can I really, really do this? But I think I've lived, I think, to your point, Joseph, I think there is something about imposter syndrome and that humble and humility side that is that has a good energy, that can have a good energy, but not too far. That keeps you grounded. I will say, though, that the one time or the one, the moments that I do not have imposter syndrome are very, very clear throughout my career, throughout my career and that's when I'm with people, that's when I'm with my people. <laughs> that's when I'm with my family. That's when I'm with my colleagues, my black colleagues. That's when I'm in people, around people that are like me. Uh, in the various organizations that I've worked in, we've had like um, network groups, black network groups. And I've always found that when I'm with people that look like me, have the same experiences of me, um, that I can relate to, all of a sudden, my imposter syndrome feelings, my stress goes way, way down. So I think that's a lesson for us all. When we're in work, when we will have imposter syndrome, make sure that you're connected with people like you and you're able to share those stories. That gives you a real respite. It's really, really important. So that leads me on to my next question, actually. So open question to anyone. What advice would you give, give everybody in the room when they're looking for their next employer? What advice would you give them? What things should they look out for? I think for me, and I guess from a ServiceNow perspective, one of the big things that drove my decision to work for ServiceNow is the fact that ServiceNow is very big on diversity and inclusion. And this is across all different spectrums, culture, gender, thought. And that drive and push and promotion of it is fantastic. I mean, if you look at our board as an example, and this is for anyone you know, trying to get into a role, if you look at our board, our board is 50% women, even though the company is 33% women, right? So there's over-representation even at the highest levels of the organization, which really shows our dedication to driving diversity and inclusion. So from my perspective and to Alonzo's point, having a company who supports diversity will make you more comfortable as you go into the workplace. So obviously you want to work for a good company, pay you well, all of those things, but you also want to be comfortable in the role. Uh, So that, that would be my advice. Yeah, and we have two black men on our board as well. We do. Yeah, Larry, Larry Q and one other. Mm. Um, and just to, um, just to add on that, so we have got nine employee belonging groups. Um, so I don't know if you've seen, if you've walked past our stand yet, but you see uh, Abby's T-shirt, Black at Now. So we have Black at Now, Pride at Now, Women at Now, Families at Now, Interfaith at Now, Asian Pacific Islander, um, 
I'm forgetting one of them <laughs> at the moment. Um, Unidos as well for the Latino community um, and veterans at now. So we've got a huge, um, a huge number of different groups. I'm on the leadership team for the Black at Now groups. We've had a lot of great celebrations last week. Um, but just to, um, just to add on that, that was the drawing um, point for me joining ServiceNow. So I was quite comfortable where I was in my last role. And uh, this is the power of networking as well, by the way. So please network with everyone today. Um, I worked with a manager six years ago. And uh, we, we kept in touch, a lovely, lovely lady. And she said, Danielle, I've got a role at ServiceNow. Um, I'd love to have you on my team. And I thought, well, I'm very happy where I am. I'm running the recruitment solely in the UK. I'm in a great, you know, big position. Um, I don't need to, what, what's the drawing point for ServiceNow? Tell me something different. Um, and she mentioned the Black at Now group. And I know there's a lot of employee belonging groups um, popping up, but I've never seen one before. And I said, tell me more, that's different. And that was the way in. That was my draw. <laughs> I was the first now. person that you saw when you joined, when you first stepped in the door. I think I was the first person the you saw. The first person I saw was Alonzo, with a big smile, that cheeky smile, the first person I saw at reception. <laughs> hey, hey, Daniel, I wanted to share uh, a tool that I use to understand diversity in any future um, employer. LinkedIn. I would typically use LinkedIn. I look under the job category that I'm in, so sales. I'll select the people filter and straight away I'm given a nice uh, list of those people in the United Kingdom and I can see, oh, a bunch of women, a bunch of men, you know, uh, ethnics. This is how I get that data to understand just how diverse that organization is because you may not find this information on their .com. Typically, the .com will focus on the executive leadership branch, but LinkedIn is the tool of choice to understand how diverse that organization is, in, is within your particular industry as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think, I think all very, very similar. The, the, the only other thing that I would add to that, I think it's important where you can, if you're looking at an organization, is to actually try to find somebody in that organization that you may be connected with and just have a conversation with them. You know, what is it like to work in this organization? And make it personal if you can, right? So I think absolutely, I think you want to have people that look like you in an organization, I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also good just to hear some of the experiences of people in the organization before you make that choice. Excellent, all right. Well, thank you for sharing your comments today and thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.